My name is Ashish Bhatia. I'm the VP of IFI for, uh, for ITAC. For Shengir also, I'm going to start introducing a little bit of ITAC. I think many of you already know about it, but the Guide Alumni Canada is a non-profit organization for all the members from alumni of all the IT um, residing in Canada. And we regularly organize you know, conferences, lectures, social events for all our members and their families to network with you know, different professionals uh, in the society. ITAC has a you know, specific mentorship program, which is called IFI, which is ITN to ITNs, and where members get like one-on-one -on -one guidance with our esteemed mentors. So we have a long list of really you know, valuable uh, mentors who provide, who take out the time and give one-on-one -on -one conversation and you know, provide you know, advice to all our members. Uh, there are 70 plus members have been successfully got the connections done through our you know, membership program. So I would encourage all of you to use this, avail this facility. Uh, there's a lot of resources on the website also. So please go there, um, have a look around. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, Anjali is also a director on IFI. So you can reach out to me or you can reach out to Anjali uh, asking about that. Now, without further ado, I would like to welcome Shengir. Thank you for your time uh, coming here today. Uh, he is a senior talent acquisition partner with Casefair, a leading global provider for cloud-enabled audit, financial reporting, analytics solutions uh, for all accounting firms, corporations, and government regulators. Shengir is also a career coach, so he helps his clients realize their full potential and live a life of purpose and presence. So he has wide-ranging experience from being a book author, a language instructor, research fellow, and a startup founder. So welcome, Shengir. And I would also like to introduce Anjali, who will be moderating this event. So thank you, Anjali, for graciously agreeing to moderate this event. Uh, she is an IT Bombay alum, and she is currently working with CIBC as a senior manager at ESG audits. So over to you, Anjali. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's session. Uh, and I'm sure you will find this very helpful and you will find the insight shared by Shengir uh, very helpful and his perspective enlightening. My name is Anjali and I'm honored to be moderating today's panel. Uh, today, we will be exploring topics such as networking, resume building, or cover letter or job search which are of interest for most of the people and whether they're new to Canada or already in the job market. So as we navigate in the job market, it's crucial to hear from an expert in the field and engage in a meaningful discussion to better understand and address some of the concerns, which are like some of the common concerns. Now, I would like to take the moment and introduce our speaker, Shengir. Shengir? Would you like to say a few lines about yourself? Um, I want to save time. I want to be mindful of the time. Everything is my, on my LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me. Feel free to pop your messages. And if you have any questions, like pop them in the chat. But I think like we have a lot, right? So I will uh, I will definitely try to address everything. But yeah, by the, by all means, as I always say, like it's not a, uh, it's not a teacher coming to the group, like imparting knowledge, right? Like it's just... Uh, Lots of friends chilling together. Like I'm just on the other side of the table. Feel free to squeeze me like a lemon to understand the intelligence behind the talent acquisition and job hunting. Uh, thank you for having me here. Thanks, Shingir. Uh, so during our discussion, I will ask a series of questions and Shingir will have the opportunity to share his thoughts. We will also open the floor for audience questions toward the end of the session. So please hold on your questions till then, but you can any anytime type your questions in the chat. To begin with our discussion, I would like to ask Shengir about his perspective on how have the job market trends evolved in the past few years? And what changes do you foresee in the coming years in Toronto and GTA job market? Uh, well, the, re the very recent changes, you can see what's happening, right? So the tech layoffs. Uh, so this is actually, uh, the, it's real, right? Especially 
people like myself, right? Talent acquisition specialists who are now working in tech companies, they are being impacted very, very severely. But overall, it's just for talents. And the companies, they uh, do not necessarily cut like underperforming people. They just cut the whole programs, right? And you can see like Microsoft and Shopify and, and others, like the thousands of people cannot be underperformers. What does it mean for everyone who is hunting out there? It means it's a huge injection of extremely uh, high talents in, in the market, right? So, uh, yeah, you, you have to be more creative. You have to be smarter about it. Uh, it's hard to predict what's going to happen. My speculation is that uh, we're going to experience this in, this year uh, for sure. But in 2024 or closer to 2024, the market will start to equalize because th this cannot happen forever, right? Uh, with all this being said, everything like this, this is it because when people come to me uh, for like, for coaching and they start recording stopped. All right, cool. So um, all these thoughts, they're not helping you. What is the, the current state of the market doesn't change anything for you individually, right? So whatever is happening, it's happening. Does it make, does it change your situation? No, right? So just uh, understand the rules of the game to play better. Wow, that's a fascinating perspective, Cheng there. So other than the recession, what do you think in the age of automation and AI? Professional can prepare themselves to remain competitive in the job market. Uh, it, it depends on the role, right? But obviously all this kind of, uh, you, you can see what's happening with ChatGPT and, and other tools like Copilot, right? And stuff like that. Uh, it just becomes easier and easier and some, some, but I don't think the roles, some, some roles will be obviously automated, right? Customer service stuff, and they are obviously under risk, but, uh, well, for more complex jobs, it's always, it's not about, it's not about the tools. It's about the person who can use the tools, the person who understands AI and who can leverage the tools is going to be more, always more dangerous than the person who is resisting to change and is not adopting the is not is not adapting to the change and it's not using the tools that are available right so even in talent acquisition if i look at my industry there are so many things that could be and must be changed using can be automated right but um i don't believe that in in my lifetime or at least in the next 15 20 years my role will be necessarily automated because being a recruiter it's not quite a cookie cutter job right uh, there's a lot of human elements in it Good to hear. So, Shengir, I came to Canada around four years ago and heard a lot about networking. Mm -hmm. It was somewhat a new concept for me. And I'm sure this, this would be a new concept for many of us are here in this uh, session. So what does networking mean to you? How important is networking while navigating in the job market? So there are two perspectives to this. So like networking, uh, I, I, I always try to encourage everyone to substitute this in their minds from networking to building relationships, right? And uh, this will obviously go away. When you're a job hunter, it's obvious, right? What's, what's, the, what's the job? Your job is a sales job. And a sales job, it means you need to put yourself in front of as many people as possible. Obviously, that comes down to, to building relationships, right? Um, however, on the other hand, uh, I do not respect networking as concept, right? Because it's not about going out there, meeting as many people as possible or shaking their hands. It, this does not matter. Ooh, what I always, again, the, the, this is probably like a personal stance, right? Build a reputation of a maker. Build a strong reputation of a maker. And then the people, your people will, will find you, right? Um, in a similar way, right? Uh, in order for me to come as a public speaker to to your organization to an event like this it's not i'm going to be knocking on the door and saying like i'm so amazing come please invite me i'm going to speak in front of your students right no it's just a it's a relationship that's been nurtured we've been friends with Shannon on on linkedin since uh, 2019 when i arrived right and i came in zero connections on linkedin right uh, and yes in, initially you will you will have to go out there shake hands and meet people right but at a certain point it's just not enough you have to be interesting. You have to be a maker. You have to build a reputation of high integrity, right? 
and that's i think the career goal because once people know you for your authenticity for your integrity for your substance and for your depth deals will start flow through you right so if something if something happens if there's an interesting opportunity right yes of course it's, it would be natural that chatton would come to me and, and say like hey i've heard about this and i always see i see you post on linkedin right you're always you're all, always in my face that's only one part of the game but another part of the game he knows me personally so he knows what kind of things i can do and what what do i stand for and that will go a longer way than just going out to networking events or connecting people with people on linkedin i appreciate your input in this yeah so there is a lot which we need to consider during networking now we move on to the next question so what are your thoughts on the hidden job market how job seekers can navigate in that market uh first of all by understanding as i said you want to play the game the best you need to understand the rules of the game what is the hidden job market right as a concept that's the number one thing that you need to understand hidden job market exists in the mind of the hiring manager once the hiring manager understands okay i need to hire someone and there is a gap either it's a new headcount uh, team team stretch too thin or someone quits someone resigns uh, very very quickly suddenly right uh, they already know so the job is not posted but the person is already looking for someone that's the hidden job market and that's again comes down to your job is to put yourself in front of as many people as possible but who are these people the people who can influence your situation directly right what is the pyramid of decision making first this hiring in the top of the pyramid this hiring manager understands uh that they they're looking for someone what are they going to do first they're going to look into their immediate network people they work with like who do i know who can deliver the quality of work and who has the integrity and who has the work ethic they can find someone level two level two is uh the team hey team you know what it likes to be a top performer you know the job you know the business you know the culture go find me someone at the same time level three they're going to come to us right talent acquisition here's the job here's the uh here's the here's the job description here's the person description the profile of the perfect candidate profile and what is the perfect candidate profile this is something that they base on their past experience right so when the, there's a lot of bias going in into hiring man, man, managers mind as well right go find me someone like that there's no other person like that we are all unique right so i can replicate top performer not replicate but bring in a top performer that would be completely different uh from a psychological perspective or even technical perspective from the person who is a top performer currently on the team right um that's that's level 3 for me as a talent partner what do i do i have two activities i either i post a job and i get applicants this is inbound right and i go and i source sourcing is the activity that i do uh, obviously the logical question is which activity is of highest impact for me well the highest impact activity for me is sourcing because i go and i proactively find people i find profiles on linkedin i understand what they do and i can see i can i can see what people have put out there and try to match them to the job if you look at applicants statistically speaking and again if this if there's a strong influx of talent um probably like for 10 to 20 people there's going to be one worth of conversation why because most people they just spray and pray you know they just send resumes everywhere without reading the job description without customizing the resume and like hoping that it will stick trust me nothing will stick because on the other side of the table there's a trained individual like myself and our job is to filter people off our job is to eliminate right this is why sniper approach only with your resume application right spray and pray throwing a plate of spaghetti to the wall hoping that something will stick nothing will stick um so that's a level four that's our applicants right sourced sourcing which means which, what's the implication for you you need to be discoverable and you need to make sure that whatever people find online is best it creates the perception that's uh, that you need right level four those are the applicants what does that mean it means that your resume should be polished to perfection right uh that's why that's uh, the thought process should be here is to reverse engineer the job description right um level four again also the engaged candidates right those who apply but also start building a relationship hey i'm super interested i want this job right start talking to to the start building relationship with the company because level five 
those are just applicants who apply and see it and wait. This is not job hunting. This is job fishing. When you send something and you just wait for something to happen, right? Versus proactive stance when you go and you make things happen. Um, I've said a lot. I will pause here, but let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to pop a question in the chat. I'm, I'm looking at the chat as well. Wow, that's very insightful, Shengir. I'm sure many of us will be benefited from this discussion. Now, we have heard a lot about ATS. So how ATS is changing the way the job seekers should approach in crafting their resumes and cover letter. Okay, I hear it a lot. When, when, whenever I hear people like, how do I do ATS friendly resume? I understand that they listen to people who've never seen the inside of the, of the ATS. ADS is not in some kind of evil robot with sitting you know, and rejecting left and right, swiping left and right the candidates. ATS is CRM, that's all. You apply online, it creates a profile, your resume is housed there, your LinkedIn profile is housed there, and all the information that you submit when, with your application, right? Uh, it's always a human recruiter that's reject, rejecting you. I, I look through all applications, right? The only thing that, and again, um, this session is recorded. Otherwise, I, I could show you the, the ATS. This is how ATS is working. There is no, no, no and, and then when you feel like, hey, it's a robot rejecting me, this is because email, email sequences and e rejection emails that you get, they are automated. Of course, if there are 200 applicants, I cannot sit, sit and send emails to everyone. There are, there are templates of emails and we just, we have a sequence, we have a process, right? If you're underqualified, bam, right? It's done. Uh, and but it is always a human recruiter looking through the resumes. And whenever you hear that people say like we spend six seconds on the resume, yes, trained person, we can we can understand from a resume within six seconds if if it's a, if it's a no or it's a maybe, right? If it's a maybe, we're gonna come back to it, take a look probably like one to two minutes. And also again, it's gonna depend on. It's up to you, Chatham. Uh, it's gonna depend on the. Uh, on the person, right? Like also, who who are you playing against, right? Some, if you look, if you, for example, it's a skill too to go to screen resumes. If you take hiring managers and give them to screen resumes, they're gonna spend like five to ten minutes on every resume, right? A recruiter, a trained recruiter, can do it within six seconds. That's very helpful to know, Shengir. Now, do you have any suggestions or any advice for, for the professionals? Uh, looking to navigate in the job market. Yeah, sorry, there, there is an inquiry. Uh, Charan, do you have the ability to pause this? Yeah, so Chenjir, I'll pause the video if you want to share some snippet of the ATS. For the previous uh, 100%, question. yeah, sure. Okay. I'll pause it for a second. Yeah, I, cl I, cl I, closed, um, I closed them with one submission. One submission, one hire. All right. Uh, I see a hand from Ajar. Hey, what's up? Hi, 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 Chengir. Uh, I don't know if I can, uh, I can pitch in uh, during the conversation. I, I think you had a very uh, interesting point there. Uh, when you were mentioning that uh, you are, you know, navigating through those applications. Uh, yeah. Uh, one, you know, maybe at once you have enough applications and then you are, uh, you know, selecting top 20, 30 and then uh, going through them. Uh, what is the like? What is the usual timeline you would look at it? For example, uh, I remember a uh, uh, few months back, I was uh, I, I I I looked at an application at, at Canada Post, and I uh, talked to a, a senior at Canada Post, and he told me that you know what, we usually don't uh, 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 process applications after seven days. Uh, we have we have it posted online, so basically they have a cutoff time of seven days, but the Posting still is active for a very long time, and um, I, I am I was in a very no, wrong motion that you no know, I can still apply, and I called him and said it's it, it's a almost uh, two two weeks uh, past the application days when it was posted. I hear so, I hear your question. There is no there is no in the in the world of talent acquisition there is no the word usual does not apply, right? Mm -hmm. Everything is unique. It's unique to the company, unique to the business, but in this particular scenario, it's just unique to the situation. It depends on how many jobs I have. It depends on the complexity of the job. It depends on how busy I am. What am I doing right at this at, at the given time, right? Like this, uh, 
business has priorities. There are some roles that are high priority, some roles that are lower mm -hmm. priority, right? Someone who is like, a, <clears throat> this is another thing, like uh, Google and, and do your research on Redford levels. Uh, Redford levels at this job leveling system. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, Redford levels is a job leveling system. So for individual contributor, there are six levels, I think, like uh, entry level, developing level, career, advanced, expert, and principal, right? And same thing for the manager, team lead, manager, manager, senior manager, director, senior director, et cetera. And then there are executive levels, right? The obviously like the, the more complex is the job, the less applicants you're going to have. I have a, like a v, VP of product marketing role right now. Right. And there are virtually there's, there are zero applicants, right? Like there's probably like once in the blue moon, someone will apply and I, and I need to create some, to make something happen proactively. Right. Uh, last week I closed the Salesforce administrator market is full with Salesforce administrators. I posted a job. It was online for four days. I had 250 applications. I had to close the job. Because I thought, like, until I go through this pipeline, I'm not going to, like, accept even more applications. There is no such thing as usual. It's like every situation is unique, right? And uh, I understand, like, it, it's, it doesn't really help you. Your, your question probably going to tie to the question of uh, Baskaran, right? How does one make sure uh, you, can, you get into a batch of resumes you deep dive into? You don't make sure. You're not, your job is not to get into the batch. Your job is to get in front of the person, which means you need to reach out. My job descriptions, on every job description, there is my name, there's my LinkedIn profile. I'm going to give you a, a scenario that will probably explain mm -hmm. a, a little bit more. Um, so I think like a couple months ago to maybe like three, four months ago, I posted the role of QA analyst. Developing level, we need only one, two years of experience. I posted a job. I had like 250 applications probably, right? And my again, my contact is there. But how many people do you think, uh, remember level five, those are the applicants. How do you progress to the next level? Engaged candidates, right? Well, you get in touch. How many people do you think, how, what's the percentage of people who reached out to me and said like, hey, I'm interested in the job out of this? Uh, out of this 300 do you think like it's 50 percent 25 5 percent yeah. 10 not percent 10 people yeah but right? uh, in my own experiences so i myself have you know tried reaching out to recruiters what do you think is is the right approach so uh i remember i i, I reached out to a few of them and you know i i didn't <laughs> get uh get get a response uh what what is the right approach like uh i mean it, it so it, it 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 feels to me that it becomes almost a one-way approach like i don't have something to offer to the recruiter and that's See, why Azar, I, I, I don't want to sorry spot to stop you right now but i think in the interest of time there are many questions that we've lined up or and sure, other sure, participants sure. have sure, actually sure. asked we'll, we'll questions beforehand yeah. so we want to use sure. the time judiciously right now i mean feel free to reach out afterwards you can have these questions uh, sent yeah. to Chengir afterwards as well. Uh, but right yeah. now, let's just spend time on the other questions that Anjali no. might have. Yeah, no worries. I, like I, uh, I've canceled my next meeting, so we don't have a hard stop, right? Like I can stay after eleven. So, uh, but Ajar, yeah, uh, that that's precisely. So two things. Last thing that you've said is very critical. I have nothing to offer with this kind of mindset. Why would anyone give you a job if you have nothing to offer? Right, companies don't need people who have nothing to offer. Right, think about it. In your mean in the meantime, and secondly, that's why that's why I tell and like I can give you like hundred reasons why career advice suck and why career advice are useless. Most of the people, same like in any job, like right? you can take any role and you will have a Gaussian distribution. You will have a like twenty percent bottom who are like who, who really suck. You will have your mediocrity and you have your top one percent performer. Career coaches are the same. Most career coaches are clueless. Most career coaches are garbage and they give garbage advice. Right, and they charge money for that. Career advice doesn't help you. Why? Because, especially like this in the group setting, because whatever I'm gonna say, do you think like there's gonna be a universal advice that's gonna work for every particular person? No, every person is an individual, every person is individual mind with individual individual equation with individual challenges, right? That's why coaching works and advice is cheap. That's why coaching is expensive and advice is cheap uh sorry for a little bit i mean we are we are probably digressing but we are still on topic satish i can see your hand you're on mute
Yo, if uh, Anjana ji permits me, you may have many, many other question, Anjana ji. I can wait. No, 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 don't worry. This is this is what I want. This is what how I roll normally, right? I come in. It's a it's a free discussion. Like feel, feel free to ask your questions. I'm here to satisfy everyone's curiosity. Well, uh, I'm not seeking a job, but you already said the career advisors are useless. But still, I will ask these questions. Yeah. Given the current situation and the way the technology is changing, the AI is entering. Our young engineers who have just graduated, they are not sure what they should be doing. What is the horizon for the next 20 to 30 years to develop the skill set where they can still comfortably feel that they will be employed? That's a big question. And I, I hear from many of them, they are not sure. And they sometimes they are going in banking, real estate. They are engineers, but they are not going in their core business. So I, I think based on your experience, what you see the trend is the next 20 to 30 years so that they can work on that kind of skill set. Again, same thing. This, this question doesn't help you in any, in any yeah, way. Any or... advice are useless, but still I said I asked this question. Absolutely. Like, and, and, I, and I think it's important to voice it and, I, and because, because the, of the way I address it. It's absolutely that this question doesn't help you in any way. Where does this question come from? What is the trend? There are 8 billion people in this world. And what's your job? How, what, how to succeed? What is your definition of success? Your definition of success is going to be unique. There are people who are, there's a 17 years old girl in the United States who's selling slime and she built a $50,000 a month business. Is it a career? Maybe. She makes money? Yeah, she's successful 100%. Yeah. There is a guy who is making videos on YouTube who is uh, showing yo-yo tricks with 3 million subscribers, right? For example. And then what is the trend? It's not about the trend. It's about what do you want? You have one life. You have one shot at this. What do you want to do? It's not about the trend. It's not about the crowd. You want to follow the crowd? You don't talk to me because I don't, I don't do stuff for crowds. Mm -hmm. I work on individual levels, right? If, you want to, if, you're, if you're curious about, hey, this is my life and I want to do something about it and I want to understand how to do it and I need clarity, that's my turf. If you say like, oh, where's the crowd going and I wanted to go with the crowd and be the best, I don't work, I don't work and I don't think in the concepts of sheeple, right? Like, in the, that's the problem with the society. We always need, people need, people need follow. People are followers, they always need to follow someone. But who are they following? Following blind leaders who are, don't understand themselves what, what they are, who they are and what are they doing, right? If you want to succeed truthfully, Right, there should be desire to you, in you to succeed, and that means one must not follow prescriptions. The world is full of prescriptions. Do this, should do this. Five steps to be happy, ten steps to be successful. Well, if you follow this, why why every year we get these books, like books on success? We were like write one good book on success, and everyone would be successful. But do you see people outside? Look around yourself. Do you see people who are ripped, six pack? successful have great relationships amazing career rich driving lamborghini you don't see that too but there are tons of books on how to do it tons of blueprints it's not about a blueprint and it's not about instruction and it's not about prescription it's about your desire how how strong do you want it and 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 having tools and clarity on what do you want it you're asking me what skill gonna be valuable in the future the skill that's been valuable since the time when we've been killing killing mammoths, the skill of adaptability, the, the skill of being, being able to reinvent yourself constantly, right? Forget about what you've been and destroy the person you've been and embrace the person you must become to get what you want. Good. Wow, we are having a lively discussion. Yeah. And I'm sure our audience will have a lot of questions. Now, I would like to cover more, one more question here that is sure. related to non-Canadian experience. So when someone comes to Canada, they do not have the Canadian experience. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there is a trend, we, we might hear that, might hear a lot about Canadian experience. So how can newcomers with non-Canadian non -Canadian experience demonstrate their adaptability and value to the potential employers you see again how's the question phrased well like how do newcomers how, how, can that, newcomer how do newcomers navigate canadian experience no how there's no how 
right? Because newcomers okay. is what is is it some kind of bucket of people that like we, we share some common traits? I mean, I was three years a newcomer. Shadon was a newcomer. You were a newcomer. But are we the same? How did we navigate our path in absolutely yeah. different and unique way? Right? Understand that, uh, like, uh, and uh, and again, I don't. I would assume that everyone's an IT professional here, right? Like. If you're a programmer in India and you're and you're smart and you know what you're doing, it doesn't matter where you are. You're gonna be in, sitting in California, Palo Alto, and you're gonna be great, right? Canadian experience starts again. It's a spectrum, right? Because applicability of this spectrum is changing depending on the role. If you're a doctor, you can't practice until you unless you're licensed. If you're an architect or a builder, right? You can't practice until, unless you know Ontario building codes and stuff like that. If you're an accountant, you want to build your career, you need Canadian CPA. Right. And all that kind of stuff. Right. If you're a pro program, uh, project manager, you need PMP if you truly want to get to the next level. Right. But for again, it depends. It's, it's, it's going to depend on every unique situation. Right. And every unique person. If you're if you're an IT professional, if you're in a business analyst and you understand what you're doing, there's no such thing as Canadian experience. Experience is experience. If you've been a business analyst and, and you understand the, the craft, the principle, the foundation, you can translate it into every business environment, right? However, Canadian experience, right? It goes far beyond the technical skill. It goes like, do you have the communication style? Do you understand how Western people work? Can you collaborate, right? Can you read the room? Can you influence the room, right? And that's and that is not just Korean, not just... Uh, Canadian experience is just life experience, right? I can work with people from every background but because I've, I've traveled a lot and I lived in different countries and I had this ex international exposure for which I'm grateful and, 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 and et cetera, right? But for people who, who don't have this, right? Then that, that's what you need to think and that ties back to adaptability. Can you destroy what you've been and reinvent what you, what you want to become, right? I understand like most of the just uh, like the audience here like indians love indian people love the culture i have a bhagavad gita next to my sofa that i read right but again when you come here yes what can i take from my culture i want to still stay indian at heart but how do i embrace the canadian ways how do i do i now i'm in rome and what do i need to do to like romans do right maybe absorb some communication patterns to see how people communicate right India for me is, for example, it still has Asian mentality. Japan, Korea, China, how do Asian people communicate? They start slow, they give the context, 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 and they slowly bring you to the point. That's not how Western menta mentality operates. In the West, everyone says, gives the point, then gives the context. This is a huge paradigm. There is like, it has to completely flip on its head in many people's heads, right? Once you do it, right, you can become a very effective communicator because this is how executive communicates. Give me minimum amount of information so that I could make a decision and then give me context if I need to. Or executives even, it's not just like give me minimum amounts. You have to make a partial decision for me. So when I work with executives, I give them, I, I give them uh, information to make, to make an approval or a decision, right? But I give them a rec recommendation as well so they don't know at least in which direction start, to start thinking. I'll say a lot. I'll pause here. Let's. That's um, excellent point. Thank you. I have. I see a lot of a lot of questions in the chat. Let's address them. Okay. All right, Dev. Uh, is uh, someone someone is laid off? Should they call out on LinkedIn? They're laid off. There's no should or shouldn't. All right. Forget about this stuff. But like whenever you hear the should it, should or shouldn't, it's always garbage, right? It's about does it is it working for you or is it not working for you? What is should or shouldn't? I don't know what's your network. If you have three people on LinkedIn, right? Like what doesn't does it matter? Would be your shout out or or you don't shout out? Or let's say there's someone like myself with 14,000 people, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna get impacted and I'm gonna scream, people, 14,000 people. I'm impacted. Please help me, right? Well, chances are my friends from my community, like Chatham, was like, hey buddy, like you know what? Let's chat. Like I I I will see who I know, etc. There is no should or shouldn't. What are you trying to achieve? What's your situation? Uh, is one page resume preferred or two pages? Or it, it does not matter. It does not matter, right? What like, how long the movie should be? Like 60 minutes or, or two hours? It doesn't matter. It's the quality of the movie, right? 
right? How long is it? And again, the resume is not the movie. It's like a teaser trailer to the movie. How long do you want to make it? 30 seconds or 60 seconds? It's not important. The content is important. The quality is important, right? I, you can send a teaser trailer like for, you can, without a resume, right? You can send like a one, one cold email. But if you craft it intelligently and thoughtfully, it can do the job and get you a phone call. Um, but I love, I, mean, I, I love questions from Dev. Keep them coming. Sorry, Anjali. What's up? Uh, just wanted to add. So yeah. shall we uh, go ahead with the questions? And we can look at the chat later. Um, well, these are the questions from, from people, right? But sure, let's let's take one from you. Okay, perfect. So, Shengir, you have highlighted excellent points. It's important to keep in mind the broader context when we are looking for job in the market. Mm -hmm. Now, we have seen many people who have long gaps in their employment history. For example, some, some women go on a maternity break or someone takes a break for their family reasons or some other reasons. So how can job seekers with a gap in their employment history effectively present their experience and skills to potential employers? Um, again, there is no how, right? I want, I, want to see, I want to understand the situation, right? Because it's going to, the, the, the overall foundational principle is who is in control of the narrative? Well, you are. You're the controlling the narrative. They don't know anything about you. When you come into the room, right? Yeah. You, I, I come into the room, you know nothing about me, right? Is is the way I present myself, the way I communicate, and you're going to build your perception based on that. I'm controlling the narrative, right? When you are, and, and then again, this is everything, your resume, your LinkedIn profile, your interview skills, everything has, serves one purpose, perception engineering. What is the perception that you want to create? What is, and, and based on that, how do you control the narrative, right? This is my narrative. That's my story. I read the resume. Okay, I've done this. I've done this. I've done this, right? And and okay, for example, there's a maternity leave gap, right? But some people say like, you know what? I shut down everything. I I turn off my phone and I went and I and I was a, as I was a mother for like two three years, right? But some others they say, you know what? Like I'm so restless and you know, like I'm raising my child, but like I st I was still hustling. I was st still building up my side business, for example, and like I don't know, selling selling graphic designs on Etsy or whatever, right? Again, when it, when you look at the individual situation, it's gonna look different for every person. The foundational principle: you are in the control of the narrative. How do you do that, right? And rightly that, said, yeah. yeah. For that, you need to understand but, how sorry. people operate. Keep going, yeah, sorry. rightly said, Schenger. Here, I want to add more context. Um, so first, we have to get to that interview part where I get the opportunity to explain myself, right? So to go to that part, how I, how what I can do, uh, or in my resume or in networking or whatsoever, so that I can go to the next level in the job interview. There is no how. Your resume is your resume. If you want to work on your story on your resume, we'll have to do it one-on-one, -on -one, right? Whatever I'm going to give you on one-on-one, -on -one, not going to be applicable to everyone else. That's one. But secondly, again, everything is perception engineering. Your, your resume is a narrative. It's your story, the way you tell your story, right? And and what, what do you want to see? In order, in order to understand what, what, you, what, what you show, you need to understand what they're looking for. And to understand what they're looking for, you understand the job, understand the job of a talent acquisition partner, and you understand the role of what they're hiring for. Really read the job description because job descriptions are not written by us. Sometimes we calibrate them, but they're written by hiring managers. This is what hiring manager is looking for. Do you truly understand what they're looking for? Or are you just like, oh, yeah, I have it. Like, whatever. I'm just going to send it and maybe it will work. No, it's not going to work. Only sniper approach is going to work. You say you don't control narrative everywhere. You can control narrative absolutely everywhere, right? Your LinkedIn profile, your resume doesn't have a voice. Your LinkedIn gives you an opportunity to share your voice, post your content, uh, tell a story from a first-person perspective, right? It, it uh, allows you to post videos. You can post, you can open a YouTube channel, Instagram. You can create all, all kinds of digital footprint that will create an ability for people to understand. 
uh, I myself, I hate using myself as an example, but it's a story. It's a cool story. So I'm going to share it. Right. Well, I was on the hunt when I first came to the country. I've, uh, I was a job developer. I've uh, secured a contract with, um, uh, JBS Toronto, right? After that, I was on the hunt for uh, for about three months, right? But I didn't stop, even though I was I didn't have a day job. First of all, I was always employed, right? I was still had my side hustle. I still made sure that I had like three, four revenue streams. At the same time, I never stopped posting content. And you know what? It was funny because uh, when I when we had a conversation with with my manager, who's already hired me, he's like, you know what? I want to share something with you. When I was looking at you and I was following you for quite some time, I see that picture and I was in a suit with my hands like this, right? And uh, some, some, I don't know, I had some kind of quote, like authenticity is everything, something like this. He says, I had, a, I had a, such a feeling that you're really this like, smug, arrogant, blunt person, right? And he had that perception for months. And then he saw my content every day and he was reading and reading and reading. It's like, what the hell is going on? Because he had a cognitive dissonance. In, the, in On the one side of his mind, I was this arrogant bastard who is like just uh, has a huge ego, overinflated ego. But on the other side, he saw the substance in my writing. And finally, he just decided to call me. He called me out of the blue. Right? I, did, I didn't normally I would be like, you know, dre dressed up, groomed up, prepared. Right. But I, my hair is messy. I'm in my home T-shirt. Like and he's like talking to me 25 minutes into the conversation. I only understand that he was uh, he was hiring me and he's and he and and that's what it is. Right. That wouldn't be possible to get that call if I gave up and I would say, you know what? Like, I don't feel like it. I feel I don't feel that I have resource. I've I'm jobless. Why do I need to say anything on LinkedIn? Why people should follow me? Right. Because it's all again garbage. Or you do what you need to do, regardless of what the current situation is. And and when people listen to you and people follow, again, if, if one person will stop, scratch their head and think like, huh, I've never thought about it this way, it will serve a purpose, right? Same thing with uh, LinkedIn recommendations, for example. Uh, I've been purposefully and very intentionally collecting them, right? And then, and it served a purpose in the end because uh, third round was with, was with the chief people officer. His name is Lorena Scott. Follow her. She's awesome, right? But she said, when I came to your profile before interview to check out who are you, right? When I saw that there are like tw almost 30 uh, testimonials over there, uh, I was like, what the hell? C-level executives don't have that many. But then she started reading them and she started looking through the caliber of people who left them. That created already a perception. She haven't even met me yet. She's not on the call yet. But this this kind of stuff is selling. It's creating the right perception. So she went through the room, and then she saw she saw me. Right, we had a, we had a good conversation. And she's like, okay, yeah, whatever I read there, matching whatever I see. The perception is complete. It's a strong yes. Let's make him an offer. Right. I'm. I'm. Thank you, Chen. Um, I'm not sharing this like to again to beat my own drum. But to show you that you, it's a, it's a complex equation, and you're always in control of the narrative. The question is how you do it. Is there a true desire in you to do it? And if it's yes, then you will find a way to do it. Thank you for sharing your personal experience, Shengir. It's very insightful and helpful. No now, in the interest of time, mm -hmm. we may take one or two questions in the chat, and then I'll invite Ashish in the end. So do you want to take the questions on the chat? Um, sure. A uh, question from Daph, is it advisable to share salary expectation transparently yeah. in the screening round? Okay. Uh, uh, in the interest of time, right? First of all, I know that uh, I'm not sure, Anjali, if you shared my, my resources, right? Here's my website. Yeah. Everything is writing. There's a huge article on salary negotiation, right? Uh, just go and read through it. There's, it's not advisable. It is, you need to understand what it is and um, how to negotiate because there are different nuances to it, different situations. Uh, I see comments, but is it, is it a question? You don't have Canadian experience. It is the past. In my humble opinion, this does not become a barrier anymore in Canada. Candidates can be assertive while being modest to demonstrate what they bring to the job. I don't uh, see any other question uh, on the chat, Ajali. Yeah, I don't see so, any other questions. So now I'll invite Ashish to, uh, to give a word of thanks, and then we will open the session for networking. For sure, for sure. So thank, thank you, you. Uh, Shengir. I mean, this is this is a very 
I'm I'm pretty sure it's very useful conversation for most of the folks here. Uh, we all the questions that we got early on were from the participants. Like we got it from the email, so that's good. Um, but again, I'm really happy that it was very engaging discussion. Like we were getting questions on the chat also, like people were asking questions back and forth. So I think it went really well. So thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule on a Saturday. Uh, so that was that was really helpful for all the members of ITAC and from IFI. I would like to thank you to you. I would also thanks, you know, want to say thank for Pankaj, who is our president, uh, Chetan, who has been instrumental, and Anjali, like main people, main pillars who were able to conduct this uh, this event. So thank you, all of you. Uh, from here on, what we plan to do next step, we'll create a breakout rooms, uh, like for smaller settings, so that individuals can interact a little bit more. Uh, it's a virtual environment, so maybe it will get time to you know, introduce themselves. If you're a new member or if you're a you know, long time member, please please feel free to you know introduce yourself, build connections, you know, talk to understand your fellow members. So I'm gonna create the breakout room from now on. And 